Hi, welcome to this video from Zimmer and Peacock entitled What is a Potentious Stat? Why do we need them and how do they work? Now the reason we start with the question, you know, why do we need a potentious stat is really asking the question, what's the problem that we're trying to solve? And so the problem that we're trying to solve with um, a potential stat is this, that you can do a um, electrochemical experiment by having a working electrode and a counter electrode. And when I mean electrochemical experiment, it could be electroanalysis, it could be a battery study, it could be a fuel cell study, it could be electrosynthesis, electrolysis, flow batteries, etc. So lots and lots of applications. Now, if I take my um, working electrode in this case, and I have a um, an ion in there, it could be um, Fe2+, plus, and I apply a potential, then we can, um, at the working electrode, we will have a potential, and the ion could... Um, oxidized to um, iron 3 plus is all very great now this oxidation of iron 2 plus to iron 3 plus is very sensitive to the effective potential at that working electrode um, but the thing about electrochemistry is it can be very sensitive to these potentials at for example this working electrode that if we have a um, effective potential that working electrode of e1 we'll get a certain current great but actually if E1 shifts to E2, and that shift is just like 100 millivolts. We could end up quite um, quite readily actually doubling that current. And so suddenly we have a electrochemical experiment that is very sensitive on the effective potential at that working electrode, and just small shifts in that potential um, can really affect the outcome of our experiment. And this really plays into a sort of reproducibility problem. So I'm going to show you in a bit that actually... They do, in a potential stat, there's, um, it allows us to use a reference electrode that allows us to know the potential um, at the working electrode and overcome otherwise ir um, reproducibility problems. So um, the working electrode um, potential is, work is equal to the potential that we apply between these two electrodes um, minus all the losses in potential that we get along the way. And these losses, um, there are many sort of um, parameters that cause um, a variation in that E loss. There's the area of the electrodes. If we use a big counter electrode, um, the potential that we lose at the counter from the counter electrode, for example, if we use a big one, then we get a less loss in potential. Um, vice versa, if we use a small counter electrode, it can give us big losses. Um, the material of the counter electrode, if you're using um, platinum, gold or carbon, you can end up with very different losses at that, for example, that counter electrode. Distance between the working electrode and counter electrode. I think this is one of the more sensitive parameters because effectively, if you have a, a working electrode and a counter electrode close together, you'll get one kind of loss. If you have them further apart, you have another kind of loss. So you can imagine people doing um, experiments on different days where they're manually setting up these electrodes. They could um, essentially have different losses and they would therefore, when they did their experiment, they would find out that their current, even though their applied potential was consistent, they actually got different um, results on different days. And it was just because the electrodes were different distances from one another. And you could imagine the scenario when actually you had different labs. So, so much of academic electrochemistry is about, I've made this new material, for example, for my electrodes and it's better than previous materials. Well, unfortunately, if that difference is only because of the way you set up the experiment, it's going to be a bit of a problem when trying to compare materials. Um, conductivity of the solution. So you can imagine that um, the losses, if you've got a highly conductive solution, then the losses will be less. But if you've got a very insulating solution, then the losses are going to be greater. So unfortunately, the experiment in this configuration, we've just got two electrodes um, it can be very sensitive to the conductivity of the solution, i.e. how much salt you put into the solution, the pH of the solution, for example. Condition of the counter electrode. So, for example, over time, electrodes can corrode, they can um, get fouled. And so, for example, if that counter electrode's fouled up, it's got material on it, then its resistance will go up and the losses will increase. So, uh, we're sort of coming up with a list of things that can happen in a simple two electrode cell like this, which can really affect the reproducibility. And as I state, you know, when you're trying to sort of write scientific papers and compare materials and argue that, you know, my nanomaterial is better than this nanomaterial, then without having this kind of reproducibility 
um, you can find it very hard to compare yourself essentially to your um, peers. So what was the solution? Um, and the solution was that um, electrochemists, and this actually originally, I think, in part came out of Leicester University um, in the 40s, um, was to put a reference electrode next to that working electrode and to be able to measure the effective potential at that working electrode. Um, so what this meant was that they wanted to control on the working electrode. It was it's straightforward enough to be able to control the potential that you apply across the working and counter electrode. Um, but then as I listed um, on the previous slide, it's very hard to control some of these losses um, that you would have otherwise had. But if you can apply, sorry, if you can measure the, um, the potential through that reference electrode, then if the losses have changed, you can ad apply, I'm sorry, you can change the um, adjusted, or you can adjust rather the applied potential. So the solution was, um, the first of all, the problem was I have two electrodes, I'm doing an experiment one day, the next day I set up the same experiment, but actually I put the counter electrode slightly further away, and suddenly my data changes. Well, in fact, if you bring this reference electrode into play, if that counter electrode moves, it doesn't matter because I'm still measuring the potential at the reference electrode. Um, sorry, not the reference electrode, at the working electrode, and I can adjust for that um, that difference in um, distance between the working and counter. So that's why when you look at something like this is a ZP screen printed electrode, you'll find out that actually we have a working electrode, we have a reference electrode, and we have a counter electrode because we're running in this three electrode mode, and we're sort of used to people wanting to use um, three electrode mode when using our kind of screen printed electrodes. Um, so I've say, stated what the problem was. I've stated that the solution is to put a reference electrode into here and then um, what's actually happening is a potential stat now is able to measure um, this potential at the working electrode through this reference electrode and is able to adjust, if, um, adjust accordingly. It actually has a feedback mechanism associated with it. So. I showed this previous um, slide where I kind of say, yep, you bring a reference electrode in and it's measuring the potential at the working electrode. You've got some fairly uncontrolled parameters, which I'm kind of calling E loss, which is st stuff that would otherwise be a variable in your experiment. Um, but the potential stat, which I will now go on to describe, takes care of all that. So um, how does a potential stat sort of work? This is um, one of the, or one, yeah, the simplest, one of the simplest designs for a potential stat. It's using a um, operational amplifier. Um, and the operational amplifier in this case is um, working as a control amplifier. So what's, um, how do I say this? How, what is happening here? So I want to dictate the potential at that working electrode. So I work up to the I oh, sorry I walk up to the potential stat. Say I'm going to do a constant um, potential experiment, um, and I can put in the um, potential. So, for example, 0.1 volts um, versus reference. So if I do that, what it's actually doing then is I have a sort of degree of certainty that it's going to try and control the working electrode at a potential of 0.1 volts versus the reference electrode. Now, what it's then doing, the potential stat is doing is it's sensing all these losses, but it's adjusting for all these losses because um, there's actually a feedback loop in my circuit, which I'm indicating um, here, where the potential measured by the reference electrode feeds back into the operational amplifier. So an operational amplifier is fixing a problem. The problem is I want to have reproducibility. Um, I want to have reproducibility because otherwise my experiments, when I record a oxidation or a reduction potential on one day. If I don't set up that experiment exactly the same the next day, I'm gonna get a different um, potential, a different current if I'm using um, constant potential experiments. It's gonna give me a problem. And I think that problem is even more exasperated when you're trying to then um, report, um, report the science in the literature because it's gone to a different lab, which may be in a different country, and they're certainly not gonna set up the experiment correctly. So electrochemists were facing this problem they brought in this concept of a reference electrode. And then the idea is that you're measuring the potential of your working electrode using this reference electrode. And then they um, were able to use a, um, a component from the Altrox industry called the operational amplifier. 
So this operational amplifier has a, as you can see here, a couple of inputs. One of them is the input that, or the potential that I want to have at my um, working electrode. So I type that into the software and that gets, gets put into one of the, um, it's called the um, non-inverting um, input on this amplifier, this positive here. Um, and it applies an output um, potential. Now, that output potential also then influences the potential here. And then it's therefore my input is actually controlling my output here. But some of that output down here actually gets fed back into the um, inverting input on my operational <coughs> amplifier. So I'll go forward a little bit more with this and um, sort of get a bit more into the math. So the maths of this is my working electrodes potential here. I, um, I'm dictated by what I plug in here, but how does this actually work? So first of all, here's the equation for a um, operational amplifier. It says that my output potential, I'm showing this at this apex here, is equal to my amplification factor. And this is quite large. This amplification factor is 10 to the five to 10 to the six. Um, so I'm at 100,000 to a, a million times. I wanna stop here for a second and say, a lot of people when talking about um, uh, potential stats, they sort of jump straight into this circuit. But as you all noted, what we're first trying to do is state, you know, why should we even care about potential stats? Hopefully we've kind of, can, we've said that the reason we have them is because we want reproducibility in our experiments um, and we want reproducibility with other people doing similar experiments. So we've brought it down to the fact that a potential stat and therefore um, or underneath the potential stat is actually an operational amplifier where we can actually control the potential at the working electrode. So the sort of governing equation for a operational amplifier is the output potential is equal to an amplification factor minus one of the, oh sorry, times the input potential, what I've entered into the software, minus the potential that I measure at the reference electrode um, and close brackets. And I will, um, what I want to say is um, that working potential potential is actually a function of what's outputted here. So it's a kind of, I'm not sure if it's ironic, but what I output ends up being also an input and it's a feedback loop. Um, so you may hear this, that potential stats essentially have an in, um, a feedback loop and that feedback loop is what gives us control. There's many things in science and engineering where you have a feedback loop and the feedback, the output, sorry, yeah, the output drives one of the inputs and it essentially helps you to con control the system. I mean, this is just a side comment, but you know, the word potential stat means um, pot, potentio, the control of potential and stat is the, the control part of potential stat. So we have an output um, which has um, at least one input which is driven by this working electro potential. And then the other input um, in line with the equation is due to the input that you, the scientist, the operator is actually put into the software. Um, so we call that equation one and equation one is kind of, in equation one there's a, there's a hidden feedback that the output drives the working electro potential, but actually that then is feeding back to the output. And that feedback, um, I'm kind of giving it this um, italic B here, is equal to the potential that we measure at, or the, the degree of feedback, the fraction of feedback, is the measured potential divided by the output potential. So the output is driving the potential of the working electrode, but ironically then it's feeding back into the operational amplifier and actually controlling the um, output. I uh, will follow the logic of the, um, it's not even, I wouldn't even desc describe this as hard maths. This is just sort of algebra. So we have a feedback um, mechanism where the um, feedback potential is um, a, f um, a function of, um, or the, of the um, working electro potential over the output potential. So we rearrange that equation and we have, in fact, um, E out is actually equal to the working electrodes potential over this fraction here. I call that equation two. Now, if we feed equation two back into equation one, 
we have a new version of equation one where the um, electrode potential at the working electrode over this um, B term, don't forget B is um, working electrode potential over output potential, is then equal to um, the amplification factor um, brackets, the input minus the working electrode um, potential. We will be rearranging um, this um, formula now. So that was my equation three from the previous slide. Um, if we simplify it, we divide both sides by um, the amplification factor, then we've got um, this term over AB now. Um, it's a bit simpler on, on, this, on this side. And then we bring across um, this minus EWE becomes a positive. Um, so we've got all the EWEs on one side and the E input on one side. Um, simplify it down to just basically putting things into brackets. But what we, the reason we do this is because it then really illustrates, um, I want to say the point that actually, don't forget that A is equal to something like um, 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 6. So it's quite a big function. So when you've got 1 over a big um, number, it's approximating to 0. So in fact, that then simplifies down to um, working electrode is equal to input potential. And so let me just restate this and summarize this at the end. Why do we have potential stats? We have potential stats because otherwise we would have a two electrode system where we would have a problem with reproducibility because um, we can lose potentials between two electrodes through things like electrode area, electrode fouling, conductivity. It makes it very hard to reproduce experiments. Therefore, um, electrochemists and scientists wanted to say, right, I will need to measure that potential of that working electrode. Let's introduce a reference potential. Uh, sorry, let's introduce a reference electrode. So that's why the um, three electrode system came into place. Now, in modern potential stats, um, we actually use operational amplifiers as the key component at the heart of the potential stats. And you will see lots of different electronic um, designs for um, potential stats. I've shown you the sort of simplest version, and in the simplest version, you you define the input potential that drives the output potential but actually on that operational amplifier some of the output is then governing the working electrode potential that which feeds back into the operational amplifier and that feedback is what allows us to say that potential at the working electrode is equal to the potential at the um, input potential and that's how a um, potential stat um, works um, so as I say, we were just solving the problem with potential stats that um, it's very nice to have, um, how would I say it, um, a two electrode system. They're very you know, easy to set up, but they do not allow a good reproducibility when reporting um, an, on an experiment or a result. But the nice thing is if you can introduce a reference electrode, you can sort of be measuring um, the I want to say true potential of that um, working electrode and it's really thanks to um, the operational amplifier um, as to how a modern potential stat actually works so if you've got any questions on Zimmer and Peacock or you want us to further expand on this um, just running in the background is one of the potential stats that we do I'll put a link to it underneath the video but as always if you have any questions the ZP um, don't hesitate to um, reach out to us and I'll also put a link underneath this video okay Thanks very much. Hi, welcome to 